Welcome to the Returnee Report. On this show, we share the stories of African diaspora who return to the continent. I'm your host, Akaliza Keza, and this is a message from home. You can find the Returnee Report on many of your favorite platforms. You can also follow us on social media at Returnee Report. That's at R E T U R N double E Report. All right, let's get on with the show. I'm so excited to finally share this project that I've had floating around in my head for probably a year. I'll begin by introducing myself and sharing a bit of my background. My name is Akadiza, and one day I'll do an episode about the significance of that name and how it's a big reason I ended up returning to Rwanda as a young woman. I was born many, many years ago in Uganda the first born of what would be three children. My Rwandan parents were both Ugandan citizens and had grown up in Kampala. When I was a toddler, my family moved to the US where my father had gotten a job with the UN based in New York. A few years later, he was transferred to Switzerland. And so we moved again. During that time, we eventually got a home in France where I and my two younger siblings would cross the border almost daily to attend school or go to church, visit friends. A few years after that, we moved back to Uganda, where I attended a new school. Uh, I was about nine years old, and it was the first time in my young life where I was attending a school with majority black, not to mention black African student body and teacher body. Now, my father uh, eventually returned to the UN in Switzerland, and so I also began schooling in Geneva. But my parents were very keen for me and my siblings to continue our education in Africa. This might come as a surprise to many people who often assume that African parents always wish for an opportunity for their children to be educated abroad. But my parents had already noticed the negative effects living as a minority was having on the psyche of their children. We watched mostly French or francophone shows, which had characters that didn't look like us, and the few that did were often comical stereotypes. Of course, there were a few exceptions, but the impact was still felt. The beauty norms were completely different, and uh, one thing I remember was hating my forehead. I was always pulling my hair in front of my face. I I still have school photos where you can just see me peeking out between the gaps of my long box braids. I was teased for those braids. Uh, Some of the students thought that they looked like the snakes on Medusa's head. I remember being one of three black girls in my year. It was uh, an international school, so the students were of many different origins, but the majority were of European descent. Now, none of this is to say that I had a miserable childhood. I loved Geneva. It was a, this was in the 90s and it was a beautiful and very clean city. I was so proud of my father and his UN office seemed like this extraordinarily grand place in my young eyes. I had a good group of friends and we looked like uh, the cover of uh, the Babysitter's Club for anyone who can get that reference. There was one Rwandan, an American, a Russian, a Cameroonian, who was my best friend. And um, I can't remember all the nationalities, but we were a very diverse bunch. But we were at an age where we didn't really understand the unusualness of such diversity. I also attended a wonderful church with my family, uh, which used to organize retreats and events for the young members. But still, having those wonderful friends and the cozy community and the sparkling city wasn't enough to protect me from what I later realized was a growing inferiority complex. Uh, I was an African who didn't speak any African language. I had little taste or knowledge of my homeland's cuisine. I remember my mom trying to make us groundnut sauce from peanut butter. It was delicious, but you know, it's... It was uh, not not the same as the original, not what she makes now, now that we've moved back. 
So, you know, I had this very vague understanding of my culture and my roots. I knew I wasn't Swiss, I knew I wasn't French, but I also knew that when I visited home, which at the time was still Uganda, that I didn't quite fit there either. My accent was made fun of by well-meaning relatives. My pathetic language skills were also taken advantage of. I remember an aunt tricking me into telling um, one of my elders that I looked like a like a rat in Kinyaranda. <laughs> she convinced me that it was a polite greeting. So yeah, I made a fool of myself. Anyway, I was, like I said, I wasn't a miserable child. These are funny memories, but still, you know, something inside me was, was damaged. I, I knew that I was, um, for lack of a better word, wrong everywhere I went, and I couldn't shake that feeling. Anyway, like I said, my parents had picked up on this long before I did. So they sent me and my siblings to, to boarding schools in Africa. For me, it was O-levels in Kenya and A-levels in South Africa. My siblings didn't have exactly the same educational experience, but we all spent a significant number of our teenage years on the continent. University was different. I went to the UK. So by the time I had finished my bachelor's degree, between school and my father's work with various NGOs and institutions around the world, I had lived in eight different countries between the age of zero to 21 years old. I had also visited countless others. I was a global citizen who was at home everywhere and nowhere. And that's when I finally decided to return, in inverted commas, to Rwanda, my motherland that I had only seen for a total of maybe two or three weeks here and there during my entire childhood. But I was determined to come back. I managed to get a six-month consultancy and the rest is history. I've been here on and off for about eight years. It would have been ten if not for the two years I spent away doing my master's degree. When I first arrived, I felt wrapped in, in the loving embrace of a parent I had never met, but had known about my whole life. But after a few years, the relationship changed. There would be comments here and there made by the real Rwandans, the ones who had grown up here. I learned about the different labels for Rwandans based on where they grew up, whether it was Congo or Uganda or Tanzania or further away. I had a, a cousin who told me that I wasn't 100% Rwandan because my Kinyaranda was so bad and even though he was kind of joking, you know, it really, I guess for so long I had wanted to belong somewhere that, you know, those little comments really hit hard. So I realized that just because I looked Rwandan, just because I had a Rwandan name, it still wasn't enough for everyone to accept me as a Rwandan and so already having deep-seated doubts about my identity I decided that that wasn't enough for me either so that's the journey I'm still on and that brings me to the purpose of this show I know my experience as a returnee is not entirely unique but I also know it certainly doesn't represent the stories of every African who decided to return home Every time I hear a story with some similarity to mine, I feel a little bit less of a freak, a little bit less of a fraud. And if I allow myself a little bit open to the idea that there isn't one definition of what it means to be an African. I thought this show would be interesting to African diaspora considering a return and also to those who are already here or just anyone who finds this topic interesting. This was a special introductory episode, but I'll explain the typical format of the show. It will be broken up into three segments. In the first segment, I'll give a brief introduction to the topic, and the second part will be responses from one or more guests, and typically those guests will be African returnees. And then I'll make a small concluding remark, and in future episodes, I hope to also include voicemails and texts from listeners to the show. I've really enjoyed creating this first season. I have a lot to learn, especially about editing, and I probably need to get much better sound equipment. But 
I'm looking forward to this experience. I hope you'll join me on this journey. Thank you to all the guests who've agreed to participate in this inaugural season. Here's a snippet of what's to come in the next episode. So it was kind of painful in the sense that, you know, I had this whole idea in my head of being home, coming back to the streets that I grew up in. Um, but then I got here and it was, um, it was different, but it was really good. Um, I really wouldn't have it any other way. That's it for today. If you enjoyed the show, please share it and feel free to post a review. And of course, remember to subscribe. I do hope you can join us for the next episode of the Returnee Report.